Thanks, Bill, for the introduction, and thanks for the invitation here. I've not been to Johns Hopkins before, so this is a great, great opportunity to be here. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to talk um, about one of the challenges, which is insecticide resistance. We've heard mention uh, this as, as a challenge in this, this talks earlier this morning. So what I want to do is just talk a little bit about um, the scale of the problem in one setting, and then also end hopefully on a, a little bit more optimistic note on, look, on talking about some of the, the new products and the new approaches that we've got to, um, to, to tackle this problem. So insecticide resistance is clearly such a, an issue because of the pivotal role of vector control in, um, in malaria prevention and we'll all here I'm sure be familiar with, with these figures here uh, from uh, a Nature paper in, in 2015 showing that the, the massive reduction in malaria burden that we've seen, saw from 2000 to 2015 was um, largely um, driven by the scale up of vector control, and that's particularly by the use of insecticide treated nets. So these have been a real success story of, um, of malaria in Africa, and they're being rolled out at a massive, um, uh, massive scale. And approximately 500 million nets every year being deployed, um, new nets being deployed every year across the continent. Um, and as a result of this, we've seen these, these, these dramatic reductions in, in malaria. But as we've already um, heard about this morning, um, success across the whole continent is not uh, uniform. And there are some countries where the malaria burden is remaining stubbornly persistent. So here, some examples here from, from Uganda, from Malawi, from Mali, and these are some of these high burden settings where despite implementing uh, recommended tools and strategies, malaria is not declining. And of course, as we've, we've already heard mentioned, we're now seeing a, a, a plateauing and in 2018 actually an increase in the total number of, of malaria cases. And so uh, one of the things that, that we're interested in is the potential contribution of the resistance to insecticides on the bed nets and whether that's contributing to this increase in, in malaria cases. So most of the work, uh, all of the work that I'm going to talk about today is uh, um, use an example from the studies, um, the country where I do most of my field work in, which is in, in Burkina Faso. Um, so this is data from the National Malaria Control Program in Burkina Faso showing the malaria, um, number of malaria cases and number of malaria deaths um, over the past 10 years. So you can see that whilst malaria, case, uh, malaria deaths have declined dramatically, the number of malaria cases is increasing year on year. And as I said, this is despite implementing the recommended strategies, including three uh, national distributions across the whole country of insecticide treated nets. So what we're trying to understand in Burkina Faso is why malaria is so um, stubbornly persistent. And so we, we've, uh, about two or three years ago now, we initiated this uh, interdisciplinary study um, on malaria in insecticide resistance Africa, using Burkina Faso as, as a case study here, to try and look simultaneously at all the potential, uh, or as many as possible, as the potential um, reasons that might explain this, this, this high, high burden, this increasing burden. So we've got here looking at, um, it could be um, factors to to, to do with, with, with the drugs or our health system factors, the distribution of their nets, um, lack of access to diagnostics or treatment, um, also that the interventions are not appropriate in that setting. So perhaps we've got a setting where we've got high levels of outdoor um, transmission or outdoor sleeping, um, or maybe we have um, a problem with the level of resistance to insecticides, the reducing the efficacy of bed nets. So in reality, it could you know, most likely be a combination of multiple of these factors or, or other factors that are not um, listed here. But what we are trying to do was just to, as I say, measure many of these um, factors simultaneously and using models of malaria transmission to try and um, assess the maximum impact that we would expect to see in, in a high burden setting like this with current interventions, given the current dynamics of the, the vector population and, the, and the, um, the, the population in the country itself. So this project's um, ongoing. Um, it's in a, a collaboration of multiple partners. And I'm not going to give the, the, the full results from, from what we think the order con contributing factors are here. I want to just focus on, on some of the, the vector related factors. So as I say, we've been, we've been working in Burkina Faso in the, in the southwest of the country in um, the Cascades district, 
where there's a very high burden of, of malaria here. And we've been doing a longitudinal study in, in 12 villages looking at entomological, clinical, and um, behavioral um, factors that, that might influence transmission. So if we look at the, the vector population itself, um, this is Burkina Faso is one of the countries um, that was one of the first countries where pyrethroid resistance was detected. And it's, been, uh, it's known to be a hotspot for, for the development of resistance. So if we look in this particular setting here, um, in the area that we're working in, this is looking at the, the mosquito survival or the prevalence of resistance over time. And uh, we can see that resistance now is very well established in this population. If we look at, uh, so this is using standard discriminating doses, if we actually look at how mosquitoes respond when they're exposed to an insecticide-treated net, the top panels, so these are all different um, nets from different manufacturers, either brand new nets or nets that have been used in the field. And the top panel is data using a standard laboratory insecticide-susceptible population, so we get high levels of mortality after the standard three-minute exposure. But this data at the bottom is um, with the same nets, but taking local mosquito populations. So you can see that the level of resistance in the population here is sufficient that the nets are no longer uh, um, killing the, the local mosquito population. So that's looking at the, the immediate mortality. And this, this is a, these are standard methods typically used by WHO to, to assess insecticide resistance. We also look to see what happened beyond that um, so if a mosquito survives exposure um, to a net, what happens be beyond that? Does it have any delayed mortality or any other fitness costs that might mean it's, it's less efficient as a vector? And this has been seen in, in we, we've shown this in, in some resistant populations that although they, they can survive um, insecticide exposure, their, their, their overall lifespan is reduced. So that would, and that's obviously gonna have an important impact on, on malaria transmission, given that we're only really interested in the survival of old mosquitoes that are old enough to become infectious. But unfortunately, in this setting in Burkina Faso, when we expose um, wild-caught mosquitoes to a net either here in, um, in the laboratory um, or in, in experimental huts where someone's sleeping under um, a net, and we have either an insecticide-treated net or an untreated net, and then we collect the mosquitoes next morning and we um, follow their survival. They um, die at the same rate regardless of whether they've been exposed to an untreated net or a pyrethroid-treated net. So, so exposure to nets here is really not having any impact. In, to insecticide on the nets is not really having any impact on these mosquito populations. So if we think a bit about how, the, uh, how nets work, of course, you get the physical barrier from, from, from a net. So you get this personal protection if you're, you're sleeping on, uh, inside a net. But of course, the, the, the power of insecticide-treated nets is also the community protection they provide. So that if a, a mosquito comes into contact with, with uh, tries to, is lured in by the, the, the odors of someone sleeping under a net, comes into contact with insecticide, if it's susceptible, then we, you know, the mosquito should, should die. But what we're seeing here in, in settings like Burkina, Burkina is that the uh, mosquito is surviving this exposure. And of course, those people then that are not under a net for whatever reason, do not get this protection that you'd get if the mosquito population was, remains susceptible to the insecticides. Now, if you've got very high coverage of bed nets, then this loss of um, protection of, of this community effect may not be so severe. If everybody is sleeping under nets and the mosquitoes are still biting indoors uh, in the middle of the night, then the community protection may not be such, a, such an issue. So, so one of the things that we've been looking at is, is the level of net coverage um, in, in this setting. So we can certainly say that there is a very high demand for nets in, in the Cascades region of Burkina Faso. Um, this is just a selection of pictures of different types of nets that we found in this setting, which is interesting in itself because at the top here is the... Um, uh, oh, gosh, yes. Hmm. I've not used one of these before. Um, this is the net uh, that... Um, uh, is distributed by the national program, so the, uh, um, the standard net that we would expect to see here. But just looking at, in, in, this is just data from, from one village, looking at all the different range of nets that we find there, we find nets from very many different sources, including national distribution programs from neighboring countries, but also ones that have been bought on the private sector, etc. So there are a lot of nets around, and the uh, most sleeping spaces in this setting um, do, do have uh, a, a net. Um, 
If we then look at, um, and, and if you ask people, you do a standard malaria indicator survey and ask them if they slept under a net um, the previous night, then the answer is, is generally yes, very, very high um, net usage. But we've actually been doing some um, ethnographic studies, some observational studies in, in these villages as well, and looking at exactly what the human behavior is and the time spent indoors and outdoors um, during uh, uh, during the night. So just to, this is just showing for data from one village here with males and females um, at, over 10 years old. So they sleep under a net, but if you look at their, be this is the percentage of time outdoors, you can see that throughout the night, um, dip depending, differs depending on the time of the, the year, the, the temperature and the different activities in the villages. But a lot of time is spent um, outside of those nets. Um, so even if you've got, uh, people have got access to nets and are sleeping under the nets, there is a lot of time um, in which they would not be fully protected. And if you've got a setting where you've got such a, a high level of, of transmission, just a few hours spent outside a net in, in, in the middle of the night puts you at great risk of receiving a, an infectious um, bite, uh, bite from an infectious mosquito. Mm -hmm. Um, if we look at the mosquito behavior itself, it follows this sort of typical pattern of, of, of an office gambit. You do see this peak of biting um, in the middle of the night. But this is in gray here is the area where people are typically indoors uh, sleeping under a net. And you can see there is substantial biting um, before and after that period. And also that there's a lot of biting outdoors as, as well as, as inside. So there are... Um, there are key vulnerabilities here that despite high levels of coverage with nets, that means that people will, uh, um, the population will be exposed to, to in infectious um, bites. So the, um, the, the, the loss of the, this community effect, the loss of the insecticidal activity of the, uh, of the bed nets in, in these settings is going to be really critical uh, in, in terms of driving the, the high burden in these settings. Now, as I say, we've been looking at uh, working in Burkina Faso, and you could say that this is an atypical region, this is an area, one that we've already heard that's one of the high, high burden countries, exceptionally high levels of transmission, and exceptionally high levels of pyrifluid resistance. But really, I would say that this is probably, uh, not trying to be overly pessimistic here, but probably this is going to be the new reality as resistance spreads through, through much of um, Africa, because we've seen, so pyrifluid resistance was first detected in, in West Africa, but these red dots here show all the areas where the mosquito populations are now resistant to pyrifluids, um, and the strength and the intensity of this resistance is, is increasing at very, very rapid rates. Um, and modelling um, uh, studies, this is work from Tom Church's group at Imperial College, have predicted that even um, quite small increases in resistance in the populations can result in um, quite dramatic increases in the level of malaria transmission. And of course, those at greatest risk are those that are non-net users um, than, than those that have the um, have access to a bed net. So this increases the, um, the decreases the equitability of, of um, nets as, a, as an intervention. So turning um, to uh, what, the, what the future holds. So if we, if we accept that in some settings, at least, we're, we are losing um, some of the, the excellent control that that's been achieved from insecticide-treated nets due to the uh, um, emergence and spread of pyrethroid resistance, what, what are the prospects for the future? Well, um, until when I was giving these types of talks a few years ago, the situation was quite bleak in terms of bed nets, and that there wasn't really anything else um, to, uh, that we could recommend when countries are uh, experiencing high levels of pyrethroid resistance and their main intervention was bed nets, we would be asked, well, what, what should we do? Um, but now we do have some alternatives on the market for, for nets. And I'll talk a little bit about these, these different types of, of, um, of approaches with nets. And of course, there are other um, vector control measures as well, um, some that are specifically targeting um, outdoor transmission or res residual transmission that will never be targeted by um, indoor um, interventions such as nets and IRS. So there's a lot of work now on spatial repellents, and we've heard about attractive um, targeted sugar baits as well. And then there are non-insecticidal methods such as uh, um, genetically modified mosquitoes or an approach that you'll, you'll hear about this afternoon from, from Flaminio about targeting the um, parasite inside the mosquito. So there's other, other potential um, interventions, but uh, currently these, these tools are um, either undergoing evaluations or still in the development phase. So, so really we are relying largely on, on insecticides for IRS or nets. So looking at what we've got for the future of nets, um, 
there were four really different different classes, if you like, all of which will still rely on pyrethroids, because pyrethroids are the insecticides with the, the fast mode of action, the low cost, the, the very high um, uh, human safety. But they've got additions to these. So the, there are nets that have got a synergist and uh, PBO, and this works to um, overcome the resistance in the mosquito by by delaying or blocking the metabolism of the insecticide in the mosquito, so, so effectively restoring susceptibility. There are nets that contain pyrethroids plus an insect growth regulator. So the idea here is that if the mosquito is resistant to the insecticide and survives exposure, it gets sterilized and that resistance cannot be passed on to, to um, subsequent generations. There was it, now, now one, one, um, insectic, um, one class of nets um, containing two insecticides, so pyrethroids plus a pyrrole insecticide, chlorphenopyr. Um, and then there's work, this is not yet um, available, but there's a lot of work on, um, ongoing about actually redesigning the nets. So the evidence base for these new classes of nets is, is increasing. Um, there have been two recent uh, um, publications last year for um, um, RCTs of these um, comparing standard ITNs to nets in these new classes. So the first is this PBO nets, these nets with the synergists, this study in Tanzania that found a 40% reduction in, in malaria prevalence in these study arms having the PBO nets compared to standard nets. And then in Burkina Faso, there was a RCT with the, uh, one of the nets that contains uh, pyrethroids plus an insect growth regulator. So the Oliset duo nets contains permethrin plus pyroproxifen. And here, the, the um, outcome here that was measured was incidence, and this showed that the, these dual AI nets um, resulted in a 12% reduction in, in malaria incidence. So there's, there's increasing evidence base for um, the improved efficacy of dual um, active bed nets um, in areas of pyrethroid resistance. And I will turn it in at, in at, at the end just to say what the status of, is in terms of deploying these um, in country. But I just want to also mention the work that's ongoing. That, so we've done, been doing a lot of work in Liverpool and trying to understand how these nets work and how mosquitoes interface with, with a bed net. Um, in order to try and inform how insecticides could be deployed in, in future net designs. So this is work led by um, Philip McCall. And this, this image here, um, you can see here there's somebody um, lying under a, um, under a net. <coughs> sorry, here. There's the head uh, and the body. Um, and, uh, sorry, back one. And these, these, all these different tracks are the, showing individual mosquitoes. So this is infrared filming that's been done in the, in the dark um, in field settings. And these are tracks showing the mosquitoes entering and how they approach the, the, the net here. And so what you can see from this is that mosquitoes come in, they're attracted by the odors, and they come into the top of the net. So they touch the top of their net first. And they actually don't make very much contact with the, with the side of the nets. And so this has led to... Um, a, a, um, some prototypes being developed where we put, we've been putting a panel on the top of the nets um, that, and this panel can then either contain a, a different class of insecticide or the same insecticide but it's obviously a much smaller area so the cost of treating this panel is, is greatly reduced. It's also a way for, from, you know, nobody's going to, there's going to be much less contact with this so the issues of, of toxicity are, are slightly um, less, uh, gives you slightly more leeway with what's on the top of the net than on the side of the net. Um, so we've been trying these out in, in, in Burkina Faso with the, the so-called barrier nets. And, and again, using this with, uh, this is showing that the mosquito approach in this, that it, this is one individual mosquito coming in and you can see it contacts the, bounces on and off that barrier net and picks up insecticide there. And so what we can see with this is that um, this on, on the left here is looking at um, with susceptible mosquitoes and this um, is looking at mosquito mortality in the study if you've just got a standard net or one that's got a barrier with the same insecticide. Um, but uh, more, more interesting given the situation in Burkina where the populations are resistant, this is the data with a um, the local resistant mosquito. And if the barrier is contained, in this case it contains an organophosphate, you can see you can get very high levels of, of um, you can restore efficacy basically by putting a, a panel of insecticide with a, um, a different, um, a panel with a different insecticide on just on this small section of the net. So I think that opens up great opportunities for how we might think more uh, creatively about, about net um, design. So um, 
where are we now in terms of currently deploying these nets? So um, in 2017, uh, the WHO um, issued a policy statement on uh, the PBO nets, the synergist nets, to, to say that in areas of pyrethroid resistance, these nets may be more effective at, um, at controlling pyrethroid resistant populations. So, and these are now being rolled out um, in, in many countries across Africa in current distribution programs. This year, there uh, will start two um, randomized controlled trials of these dual active um, AI nets. So the Interceptor G2, which contains pyrephoids and chlorphenopyr, and a second type of net that contains the insect growth regulator pyroproxifen. Um, so we'll get more data on these. But the, also, in addition to the um, RCTs, um, there is now a um, pilot, se several countries have already made the decision to um, implement some of these nets as part of their distribution program in areas where they have very high levels of pyrethroid resistance. So this is a map just showing the western uh, part of, of Burkina Faso in the different districts. And this is what their distribution, their net distribution program will look like in the summer of this of 2019. Um, so here we've got um, the standard nets in, in blue um, and in, in, in the pink color is the Interceptor G2 chlorphenopyr nets and the PBO nets in yellow. So they have made, uh, with support from the UNITAID new nets project, they've made the decision that the pyrethroid resistance is such a high level at uh, this part of the country that they want to implement these new nets and evaluate them as they're implemented rather than waiting for the results of the, of the trial. And so we'll be involved in, in sort of monitoring the, the impact of this from uh, um, both the uh, clinical aspect but also the entomological impact that this will have. So really to, to, to conclude and to try and address this question of whether we do have the, the new tools to tackle insecticide resistant uh, vectors in, in Africa, I think it's clear if we just continue to rely on pyrethroid um, only nets, um, malaria instance would, would continue to rise. And so it's, we are, I think, just, uh, just in time really with these, these next generation nets. And we've, we, I think that it's testament to uh, the need uh, uh, for these nets, that how rapidly they've been implemented by, by many countries and supported by many donors following the, the WHO um, uh, uh, listing. Um, so we're hopeful that these next generation nets might help restore the community effects that we're getting uh, that have been so successful in driving malaria down um, across Africa. Um, there's much that we still need to do in, in advising countries and getting the evidence base to, for, to establish where and when these new nets might be most effective, because of course they're going to cost more. And so there's going to be this, this issue between universal coverage and getting effective products out in, uh, into the field. Uh, and it's also clear that in these high burden settings, there is just too much transmission that's occurring when people are not protected by the nets to rely on nets alone. So we're not going to be able to achieve these elimination goals with just nets. But it's essential that we have effective bed nets to, to avoid seeing this rebound in, in, in malaria. So I think, as, as has been recognised in the earlier talks, we are going to need layering of multiple interventions to achieve these goals. So I'll finish just by acknowledging uh, the Wellcome Trust for funding this study in, uh, um, in, in Burkina Faso and thanking the, the team at, in Liverpool, Imperial, in CNFP and Burkina Faso and, and other partners for contributing to the work that I showed today. Great, thank you, Professor Renson. So we have time for a couple questions, if there are any. And please state your name and use uh, affiliation and use the microphone. Uh, ben Kreisich, NIH. Uh, I'm just curious if there's any push with these new nets to maintain efficacy and think about ways we could possibly redistribute nets or, or make a promise to keep efficacy of the nets we do distribute high through refreshing them frequently or some other measure. Yeah, uh, so um, I think um, I've just been talking in the break actually about the, the lifespan of nets in the field. I mean, with the, the whole distribution programs are, are reliant on a three year lifespan, which seems to be uh, in most settings not really achievable. So, so that yeah, there is, there is this big issue that after after eighteen months after a distribution program, then the coverage levels is going down. But of course, that's a resource a resource issue, really. Um. Hi, David Smith from the University of Washington. I have a question about the um, the controversy over 
the, the approval of some of these new nets that when you add a uh, different insecticide to the net that it might change the mode of action. For example, it might have a more of a, a repellent effect. Mm -hmm. um, has Phil McCall in that uh, tent system had any look at these sort of new insecticides to see whether it changes contact rates? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, yeah, so, um, yeah, there's lots of, in terms of thinking about effective resistance management strategies, there's lots of interest in combining products so you make sure you don't have a single AI product, I mean, not so much like combination drugs, that all new nets should have more than one active. But of course, if one of those actives is very repellent to a mosquito, you, it may not come into contact with it. So yes, we are screening all the possible combinations of new insecticides to see how that affects the, the behavior of the, uh, the mosquito and check that we're not, that we are gonna get contact with, with both. <coughs> Standon Koma from BI Resources, ATCC. I'm wondering to what extent do you think improved case, uh, improved case detection has resulted in increased number of cases in this particular setting? So sure, yeah, I mean, the, the, the data in Burkina that is showing uh, these, these increases in uh, uh, malaria cases, of course, could, could be indicative that there are, there's, there's better detection. Having spoken at, at length with uh, the uh, malaria control program, it, in Burkina about this data and looked at the timing for the introduction of RDTs and all the other changes that have been happening. They certainly do not think that that's the sole explanation, but it, it's hard with routine surveillance data to know whether what, what all the confounders may be. One more. Yeah. Helen Kwanashe from Amadou Bello University, Nigeria. My question relates to the wide range of nets that are available. Have you checked the Pyrethroid's content to make sure they are up to standard. Check the pyrethroid content? Yes. Um, it's a very good question, actually. Um, yes, yeah, so the, the nets all have to, um, the P, the, they had to all be pre-qualified by WHO, who are responsible for assessing the um, uh, insecticide content, the safety, um, basically say, agreeing that the net does what the manufacturer says it does. But it's very challenging to add a new insecticide to a pyrethroid and maintain the rate at which the insecticide migrates through the fiber and um, remains active on the surface. So there have been some challenges, I believe, from in, in manufacturing these nets to make sure that we're not losing the, the pyrethroid efficacy. But that is being, being looked at by WHO.